So I'm going to pass it over to uh, uh, Dr. Kelly Sandberg and Shelly Dow from Dayton Children's to talk about the Shared Decision Making Toolkit, which is the video that we just watched. So uh, take it away. Great. Um, thanks for uh, having us be a part of this. My name is Kelly Sandberg. I'm the uh, physician lead at Dayton Children's Hospital, also the uh, Chief Medical Quality Officer. This has been um, a wonderful, wonderful project to work with uh, Shelley Dalbon. Um, we have uh, co-led this project. Uh, this video is embedded within the shared decision-making tool that we'll show you, uh, we'll show you shortly. Um, we do have to give a big thanks to the Clara Foundation and to ICN. Um, this was spurred on by an innovation grant intended to support uh, shareable co-produced tools that benefit IBD patients. Uh, Chris, could you hit the next slide? So we know that surgery is not going away as a treatment option for refractory IBD. Next slide. And we know that it's a big decision to have surgery. Go ahead. Families facing surgery have a lot of questions and concerns about how surgery might harm self-image or how it might affect their child physically and socially, both in the long and short term. Next slide. And although we don't know who the right candidates are for surgery, when the right time is, when the right place is, um, this project certainly is informed by those questions. Chris, if you can hit twice. Uh -huh, next slide. So Shelly and I were um, forming a multidisciplinary team that included a lot of parents, uh, patients, faculty and staff uh, from among uh, gastroenterology, surgery, psychology. We had a shared decision-making uh, consultant, a woundostomy nurse, uh, as well as creative support for marketing, illustrator, animator, and web developers. Next slide. And we had all these ideas. We, you know, we wanted to, to put all of these things into one tool that could be useful in, um, in, in that uh, clinical circumstance. And so we took all of, of these ideas. Uh, we took this idea of, of, of having a, uh, um, that video that we just saw uh, embedded within that tool. We found um, some other, uh, what we felt were really useful tools when it came to shared decision-making, including the Ottawa Personal Decision-Making Guides, and uh, ran some PDSAs and, and tell what, um, what we have produced. Next slide. And so the toolkit includes uh, some parts that are meant to be delivered in person uh, on paper. This includes the guide for clinicians, the pathway to surgery, and an intro template for patients. And go ahead and click, Chris. And then as well as the, the web-based tool that lives on the ICN slide, site. Uh, next slide, please. And so if, Chris, if you just click through these, uh, a, a few screenshots, these also should be available on the ICN website um, as part of the toolkit. Again, kind of the introduction, uh, the guide for clinicians, how to use this tool, when to use it, uh, a suggested pathway to surgery, um, as well as the full tool. So I go ahead and go to the next slide there, Chris. That should be um, the cue to uh, the web-based tool. So I'm gonna hand this over to Shelly Dow. Um, she's gonna give maybe a little introduction of herself and her experience and then take us through the tool. And um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Shelly, do, do you wanna take it or can you? Also, I think you're still muted. Yes, I'm happy to take the screen, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. All um, right. Go ahead. So for those of you who don't know me, um, I am a parent of five sons, and two of them have inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, it's been a long journey. Um, my son, uh, one of them was diagnosed when he was six years old in 2000, and two years later, his younger brother, who was four years old, was diagnosed. The first child was diagnosed with Crohn's disease and the second with ulcerative colitis, which left a lot of questions in our lives. Um, so in 2009, when we were told that both of them needed to have surgery in the same appointment at the same time, I was overwhelmed. My whole family was overwhelmed. My sons were young enough that they shut down and didn't participate in the decision. 
um, they didn't know what to think of it. It was traumatizing, it was scary. Um, we thought that they both were going to have to have colectomies, but their diagnoses were still different. Neither one of them were responding to any medications. In 2009, we had 10 hospitalizations. Um, we tried all sorts of medications, lots of steroids. We learned that they were refractory to um, the steroids. They couldn't tolerate 5-ASA drugs. They weren't doing well on immunomodulators. They were not responding to the TNF drugs. So surgery really felt like the only choice um, from a provider's perspective. But from a parent's perspective, it felt like the last choice that I wanted to make for my children. And so we sought second opinions, we sought third opinions, we ended up changing doctors, changing care centers. In the end, ultimately, neither of my sons had surgery. They are now 22 and 25. They are both in clinical remission and doing fabulously. But when I look back 10 years ago at that, that really dark and difficult period, I still wonder sometimes, did we make the right choice? Did we have the right decision, the right support to make a good decision? Um, and so out of those thoughts came a lot of stories from me. And as I volunteered over the years with ICN, with my care centers, through CCF, I met more and more families and providers who said, yeah, this is so hard and traumatic and isolating and scary. And how can we help patients better? Um, I remember one mom sitting um, in a meeting and just, you know, just sobbing. She said, when my daughter was faced with ostomy surgery, the only person that we could find to talk to her about it was a 45-year-old woman. And it just wasn't helpful to them. So when we, um, as a team at Dayton Children's, decided to apply for the innovation grant, and we had some brainstorming sessions to talk about what we might want to present as an idea, surgery just kept coming back to us. And initially we thought, oh, we just want to talk about ostomy surgery. But once we really dug into this and started looking at shared decision-making ideas and talking to different members of our team, we realized that we needed a tool that was very basic for all types of IBD surgery. And so um, we're excited today to show you if I can get my screen to share, the um, web tool that is designed for teens to encourage them to share in their decision to have surgery. So Shelly, is it, is it working? Uh, you tell me. Yeah, there we go, sorry. Yeah, all right. <laughs> perfect. All right. Uh, we can also see your, um, like the bar on the, the file download bar on the bottom if you click. The, uh, yes. Next to show all, yeah. I mean, I'm, we're happy to look at your downloads. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Um, all right, so this is, I don't know, the screen size seems really large to me, so I'm going to zoom in a little bit so you can see. This is the landing page. This tool lives now on the Improve Care Now website on the tools page, which you can see the link is right here. You can click into that and get to this tool. Um, the landing page for the tool is um, very, let's see if I can, it's very basic. The tool is designed to be completed from beginning to end. Um, because of privacy concerns, none of the information that is shared in the tool is saved. And so once a patient starts it, we recommend they take at least 15, um, maybe up to 30 minutes to finish it. Some patients may take longer than that because there are a lot of embedded links and a lot of exploring that you can do. But for now, let's get started. So when you click into the tool, the very first page is called About My IBD. We realize that sometimes as a parent, it feels like our, our child is sitting through the appointment and just listening and maybe not talking very much. And we often feel very confused about what our child knows and doesn't know. Well, our providers feel the same way. So we included a page that allows the patient to share what they know about their IBD. The cool thing I think about this page is that we also included um, definitions for any words 
like fistula or abscess that maybe the patient has heard but doesn't really know exactly what the definition is. Um, I guess I should go back and show you if, I'm gonna just click some answers here in general so that at the end I can show you the printout. At the end of this uh, tool, a patient can print or save all of their answers and then share them with their provider if they choose to or with anyone that they choose to. Another cool thing that we did was as we looked at pictures of surgical options, we realized many of them were kind of scary and we didn't really want patients digging around on the internet looking at whatever pictures happened to pop up. So we thought that we could maybe um, provide some very simple illustrations of different types of surgery um, just to ease that curiosity about what this would look like. And at the end of that page, you move on to get the facts. Sometimes patients don't feel like they have other options. Once they hear the word surgery, they just assume that that's the only direction they can go. And yet it's terrifying. And sometimes the decision doesn't have to be made immediately. And there can be other steps along the process. So we've included just, again, some very brief teen-friendly descriptions of different types of therapies that could be tried. Within each of these definitions is a link to the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation website that has more information about each option um, for those patients who want a little more depth to the knowledge that they get. We continued here with the theme of highlighting words that might be um, unfamiliar, like incontinence, and um, I think we have strictures here that are highlighted. Just some very basic things that you should know about why doctors might recommend surgery for you. Because ostomies can be a part of almost any IBD surgery um, or many IBD surgeries, we also wanted to include some, um, some more in-depth information about ostomies. So here we have three different tools. We have the ostomy toolkit, which was made by the PAC, and you can click here and link directly to that. We have just a three-page uh, sheet written by a patient who is now a psychologist who was part of the PAC, Dr. Jenny David, um, written in very simple teen-friendly language, talking about things like, what do I wear? And how do I manage this in public or in class? Um, and so it's very helpful. And then of course, this is the Dear Ostomy video that we showed at the beginning. Um, I hope you take time to watch it again later. It showed fairly well, but it was kind of buffering a little bit and a little glitchy. So I would like for you to see it without that um, effect. This is one of my favorite parts of the tool. It was created in conjunction with Becky, um, who spoke in one of the earlier sessions. Um, Becky is a friend of mine on Facebook, and I saw a post that she had written to her ostomy on their anniversary about how much she was appreciative of the fact that her ostomy gave her her life back. And so Becky and I worked together to develop a script, and then um, we worked with an animator to create this video. So it's really just a very special part of this tool for everyone on our team. Below you'll see there are some FAQs and those can be opened up. Um, I won't go through all of them, but again, we have some illustrations and simple definitions um, that patients can look at. The next page that we move to is comparing options. So it's not enough to know that you have options. I think it's important for patients to know what's involved with the different options and what the pros and cons and risks and benefits are. Um, we intentionally kept this page very, very generalized because surgery is different for every person and every provider has a different approach to surgical management. Um, so we simply gave the basic facts, um, hoping that it would prompt questions from patient to provider. When we move on to the next page, again, this is a favorite part of the tool for me. We worked really, really hard with um, our psychologist, um, Dr. Jackie Warner, with Dr. Jenny David, whom I mentioned earlier, 
and with many, many parents and teens on this page, we ask them to put together um, a page of things that, that might be important to a patient who was facing surgery. And at one point we had, I, I don't know, 10, 15, 20, dozens, I don't know, lots and lots of pages, many questions. And we took them to our Family Advisory Council over and over again and just kept culling those, those um, questions down to get to some very basic and simple um, things that a patient might decide were important to them. Um, and of course, knowing that we can't capture everything, and I'm just going to click a few here, we, we left an other box at the end of each of these so that a patient can type in what is important to them. Um, but we definitely wanted to address the fact that having surgery might make you feel nervous, angry, anxious, depressed, without um, planting ideas in your head that you should feel nervous, anxious, angry, or depressed about surgery. And then at the bottom here, um, because many of the families that we talked to felt pressured to make a certain choice, we really wanted to ask that question. Because if a parent or a physician or a nurse is making a patient feel pressured, that's the last thing any of us want. Um, so often encouragement feels like pressure and so we just wanted to add that option in for a patient to identify that. The other thing that is on this page that I think is really important to note is this blue box on the right side. Um, we wanted to normalize and destigmatize the idea of talking to a mental health professional and to include a couple of options here, um, as Clint mentioned earlier, for reliable resources for connecting with someone else who has IBD. And then we move on to the next page, which is building your support team. Um, when Clint said earlier that he was in isolation and had to make the decision to have surgery by himself, truly my heart just broke. Um, I cannot imagine, even as an adult, making a decision like that by myself. And so um, when time allows for a patient to build their own support team, I think it's super important not only to ask, as we do in this section, who you might want to be on your team and who you want to help you make, help make the decision, but to identify who you want to make the decision with or to give the option of, I want to let someone else decide for me. I'm really not in a good place to make this decision. Um, and then down here at the very bottom, we give options again for things that patients often feel uncomfortable about asking for. Um, second opinions. I want to talk to a different surgeon or a different GI doctor, or maybe I do want to talk to a mental health professional and I've been asked that five or six times in clinic, but I haven't really been brave enough to say those words out loud. So we just wanted to give some options there as well for a private and um, less intimidating way to share that information with your provider. Um, and then finally, the last page here is my decision. Um, on the right, again, we have some links to websites that have great information. And then, although we um, definitely say that you don't have to make a decision today, we do want to assess where you are in the decision-making process. So we ask questions like, do you know when you need to make a decision? And do you understand your options? Are you clear about the risks that matter to you? And do you think you have enough information to make a choice? Um, and then at the bottom, if you've said no to something, you can check what you need to do before you make the decision. And there's a free text box to add any questions or concerns that you might have come up with as you worked through this tool. So at the end of this tool, there is an option to print and save. And this will load and you'll get to see a little preview. I don't know if I can make this big enough for you to see. Um, I hope you can see this, just a little preview of your answers to the questions that you can share with your provider. So that's an overview of the tool. And Chris, I'm trying to figure out, oh, there's stop share. 
Here. I hope that worked. <laughs> um, next steps. People have asked us what the next steps are for this tool. Um, it is on the website, ready to go. You can use it. You can recommend it to your patients. You can share it with your friends. We'd love for you to share it on social media and just get the word out. Um, we were asked at the live online community conference about uh, making a Spanish version. It's a conversation that we've started. There are some costs and logistics involved with that that we'd have to work through. Um, right now, the tool is only, I shouldn't say that. Right now, the tool works best on a computer screen. Um, so one of the things we would like to do is find a way to get the funding to make the um, tool adaptable for all screens so that a teen can use it on their phone or on their iPad. Um, it, you can do that now. It's just a little glitchy. It's not perfect. Um, again, all of these things cost money. Um, and then the thing that we're really excited about is that Dr. Sandberg, Dr. Warner, and I are going to work with the Dayton Children's Team, team to study the effectiveness of the tool. And um, by that, I mean we want to do a qualitative study and see if it really does make a difference in a patient's experience of care as they contemplate the idea of surgery. So I have not even been looking to see if there were any questions at the bottom here. Um, Chris, can you tell me if there were any that need to be answered? Hey. I didn't see any questions. Um, if folks have them, if you wanna, if you wanna type them in there, how about um, Shelly, if, if we go to Maria and then if folks type them in the chat box, you can get them, you can like reply to them in the chat. Does that work? Yeah, that's perfect. Okay. That's perfect. I think the final thing that I wanna say before we go to Maria is that I think every care center is capable of doing something like this. Um, I'm so grateful to Dayton Children's. We had support all the way at the very top level of the hospital and access to all sorts of tools and allowing physicians to donate time, giving me access to things as a parent um, so that I could just call up the marketing folks and talk to them. It was really a phenomenal um, process and great teamwork. And if there are any care centers that wanna learn more about how we did this together, We'd love to talk with you.